Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you all here. I hope you've enjoyed your day at sea and uh, found lots of things to explore here on the ship. And thank you for all of you who braved the lines to get into the Explorer's Dome this afternoon to see the Planetarium show. I promise you, if you didn't get in, we will be doing more of those during the course of the cruise. So uh, I, again, apologize that everybody was able to get in there. It's a very intimate setting, and uh, we only have 26 seats in there, so it's hard to get everybody in that wants to attend, but we will do more shows. Again, I'm Jonathan, your regular, your regular Viking resident astronomer, and I'm pretty regular too. I show up on time when I try to. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about protecting Earth from external threats, and uh, I call this my duck and cover talk. The, our Earth is a fragile place. If you talk to astronauts or people who've seen the Earth from the outside, the first thing that those people will tell you when they, uh, the Apollo astronauts, you know, realize that you could hold your thumb up and cover the Earth as, uh, as seen from the moon. Uh, wh when those, those folks realize that, you know, we have this planet that's protected by a very thin veneer of atmosphere, and space is incredibly empty, and, but the time scale we're looking at when we think about the history of the solar system is incredibly large, and so if something can happen, it likely will happen at some point. And so we need to be thinking about the possibilities that even if, if we're looking at extremely remote possibilities, that some things could possibly happen that would not be very good for us or for our planet. And I, I liked listening to um, the Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikert, who was part of the B612 uh, Association, which is aimed at protecting Earth from asteroids. But he likes to say that as children mature and grow up and they eventually take care of their parents, we, uh, the, our ch as children of the Earth, have grown up and matured, and now it's up to us to help take care of our mother Earth and to help protect it from outside threats. And so what we're going to talk today about is what those threats might look like. We're going to be talking about asteroids and comets. We'll be talking about solar storms. We'll be talking about the threat of contamination by extraterrestrial biology, supernovas, gamma ray bursts. And uh, if, if this doesn't scare you by the end, you know, I don't know what will. But no, there, there, are, there are some things that we can do, some things that we can't do. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about putting some sense into what uh, protecting the Earth from, the, from outside threats actually looks like. So how can we protect ourselves? And are there things that we can do or things that we can't do? So to put some things in context, I'm going to start with talking about asteroids and comets. And I would like you to, to th go back to Russia on the 30th of June, 1908. Uh, a man sitting at his trading post in a small town in Siberia uh, suddenly was knocked out of his seat and felt his clothing felt so hot that he felt like he was on fire. He was 40 miles away from the Tunguska event. He was the closest human to that event that we know of. He was 40 miles away and he still felt like he was on fire from this. This was an asteroid about 120 feet in diameter that was traveling more than 33,000 miles an hour. It exploded 28,000 feet above the ground, so it was an airburst type of thing. It was a five megaton blast. It destroyed 800 square miles of forest and flattened trees. You can see pictures of the trees here. These were taken 20 years after the event. It was about 20 years. Uh, it was 1927 by the time the first scientists were actually able to get to Tunguska and look at this. And they saw this area of trees that was flattened, uh, 80 million trees that uh, they lost their branches. The, the shock wave was so intense that the branches were stripped off before the trees could even feel the effect of the shock wave. So this was four times the size of the devastation of the Mount St. Helens event. We didn't actually find uh, the asteroid, any pieces of that asteroid. We found uh, microscopic bits of it embedded in the peat, but because it was an airburst, it exploded, and there's no crater there as such. So, uh, so this is probably one of the more famous ones that happened in our uh, recent history, but, but the most famous one we'll be looking at is uh, what we now know as the, uh, the Chicxulub uh, disaster, the thing that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And this was 66 million, 50,000 years ago, give or take 10,000 years. Uh, we know it happened in the late spring or early summer because of pollen grains that we found embedded in here. But an asteroid traveling um, about 50,000 miles an hour released the equivalent of 30 mil 300 million nuclear bombs when it Im impacted uh, what is now the Yucatan Peninsula. We think it was a carbonaceous chondrite. It was about the size of Mount Everest. So we're talking a, an asteroid 10 miles in diameter. The, the, uh, it threw off several trillion tons 
metric tons of material, some of which escaped out into the solar system, some of which became incandescent and fell back down onto the Earth, and it, it burned up 70% of the Earth's forests from that material falling back into the atmosphere, superheated. It created um, tidal waves that were several hundred feet high and went several hundred miles inland. Uh, there was the simultaneous mass extinction and burial of uh, multiple species as a result of this. Uh, dinosaurs were wiped out literally that day. Uh, so it's not one of those things that caused a gradual extinction. Some species were completely wiped out within minutes of the, of the impact. And then the impact continued to cause uh, issues. As you saw here, we had clouds of dust and, uh, that circled the Earth for more than three, or three to five years and caused a, what we would call now a nuclear winter. It caused the collapse of vegetation and the ecosystem. And 70% of the Earth's species went extinct as a result of that explosion, that impact. So uh, it was, you know, we used to call uh, asteroid impact, it had what we like to call a giggle factor, that people thought it was not something we should take too seriously. But when this theory came up in the late 70s and early 80s and then was eventually proven by studying the, the uh, layers of sediment that had iridium, which is only found at that constant, uh, this type of iridium is only found in meteors and asteroids, then we began to realize we do have this threat from the outside. So per perhaps the biggest threat uh, that we've studied, but then there have been even more recent events like in Chelyabinsk, Russia. And so this was a meteor traveling 40,000 miles an hour. A lot of uh, Russians recorded this on their dashboard cameras as they were going into work that morning. Uh, this meteor exploded about uh, 10 to 15 miles above the ground over the course of 30 seconds. Came out of nowhere. You saw this bright flash. You see here, uh, this is another picture of the, uh, the asteroid exploding. Uh, again, 10 to 15 miles above the ground. So you think about this 10 to 15 miles above the ground. The shock wave is going to travel at the speed of sound. So a lot of people saw this and heard there was something really spectacular in the sky and they went rushing to the windows or they went rushing outside and then the shock wave hit. So I don't speak Russian. I can't, I can't say what the person is saying, but I know he doesn't sound very happy about this. But people who, who rushed to the windows were, uh, were injured by flying glass from the force of this um, shock wave as a result of this meteor exploding in the atmosphere. This was actually a relatively small one. This was only um, a, about 100 feet in diameter. So this, as, as some of the killer asteroids go, this was a relatively small one. But things like this happen in places around the Earth. Most of them happen out over the ocean. This one happened to happen over a uh, major populated city. And you can see here some, here's some video of what happened as a result of that explosion. Blew out a lot of windows. Several thousand people were injured by flying glass. Luckily, nobody was killed by this, but it was, this was a real wake-up moment for us that these kind of things do happen, and we need to be thinking about ways to protect ourselves. Uh, and so this is the type of injury that we saw from the Chelyabinsk explosion. And so, uh, you, you know, this is a very real threat for us. Uh, uh, on the lighter side, people wonder why meteors always land in craters. You know, this is... Uh, and, and this, is, this is Meteor Crater in Arizona. And not only did it land in the crater there, but it just barely missed the visitor center. And luckily, there was a, a the road leading out to it. But this is the Behringer Crater in Arizona. Uh, this one was created by about a 50-meter diameter uh, metallic asteroid. And uh, just to give you a size of the crater, it's about a mile in diameter, but you could, this is how big the pyramids are uh, relative to that. This happened uh, millions of years ago. But again, this is the kind of thing that could happen. And we see scars all over the Earth of meteor impacts and asteroid impacts in the past. So to give you a, a, a context of what might have happened when that, that asteroid hit or exploded, we had a fireball that went out about six miles from the, the impact area. Large animals would have been killed or wounded out to about uh, 15 miles away from there. And then you still had hurricane force winds. So this was a major event. Uh, if that kind of thing happened over Manhattan, you would have this area in the red, which would be certain fatality and total destruction, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb on Hirosh Hiroshima. So you see that the area of destruction, if, if something just happens to come in over a major city, that's the kind of, uh, of issue we're, we're dealing with here. So again, very rare because the Earth is large, about 60% water, 
Uh, this is a, a video of um, the 20 asteroid impacts that were between uh, 1 and 600 kilotons of TO TNT between 2000 and 2016. And you can see that these impacts happen kind of randomly all over the Earth. A lot of them are happening over the ocean just because there is ocean. Uh, a lot of these we, did, we wouldn't have known about except for spy satellites that are up there to detect nuclear tests. So we see the energy from these, um, these air bursts. Almost all of these are asteroids that disintegrate as air bursts. Uh, we have learned that uh, what happens is as asteroids are coming in at tens of thousands of miles an hour, the pressure at the front of the, the pressure difference between the front and the back of the asteroid is such that it causes them to explode uh, usually tens of thousands of feet above the ground. So you have these airburst types explosions, very, very rare for these stony meteorites or asteroids to impact the Earth. But you can see there is uh, you know, pretty good coverage all over the Earth here. These things are randomly happening. And so there's an average of two of these types of things per year. Uh, an impact of enough energy to destroy a city happens about once every 100 years or so. But luckily, most of these are over unpopulated areas. So how big is the threat? What is causing these kinds of things? We've got, obviously, asteroids and meteors and all kinds of junk that's floating around in the solar system. This is remnants of the early formation of the solar system. Uh, Jupiter kept a lot of, the, uh, uh, kept a lot of uh, bigger objects from forming in what we call the asteroid belt just because of its gravitational influence. So we have a lot of things that crashed into each other and broke up and created smaller pieces. But so wh when we talk about potentially hazardous objects to the Earth, we're thinking about things that are near Earth, meaning they pass within four and a half million miles of Earth, and that they're greater than 450 feet in diameter. So what, what is the size of the threat? This is the orbits of the ones we know about. 29,000 asteroids, 100 short period comets that we consider potentially hazardous near-Earth near objects. So as, as the scale of this became more apparent, as we got to know more and more about what's going on around us, obviously, even as they say, even Congress sat up and took notice. Um, but Congress has, has mandated NASA back in 1998 to find 90% of these one kilometer size near-Earth objects and then pass another resolution to find 90% of the ones that were, were smaller within the next 15 years. So NASA has been working on this. Uh, unfortunately, it's not gotten the priority of funding that some of the other NASA missions have. And in fact, in April, the White House just issued another directive for NASA now to coordinate um, its planetary defense uh, offices. And we've got a, a satellite that will be going up to, to survey these near-Earth, potentially hazardous near-Earth objects. So how many of these things are there out there? So the ones that are four meters in diameter that could uh, leave meteorites, there is about 500 million of those. As we get larger, you see the number of them goes down. The ones that are potential, potential uh, metro, uh, dangerous to metro areas, about 25,000 of those asteroids, 900 that are big enough to cause the collapse of civilization, and four of them that could cause the mass extinction of life. Luckily, we know where all of those are, of the big ones at least. And as you can see, we, uh, the bigger they are, the easier they are for us to find. We found much a uh, smaller percentage of the smaller objects out there just because there's so many of them out there and because also we're, um, we're looking in a lot of cases back towards the sun. But at least we know that the major ones that are potential extinction events like uh, Tunguska, excuse me, like uh, Chicxulub, we know where those are now. So how do we go about finding these? And, and right now we've been using Earth-based techniques to do this. Uh, this is Kitt Peak Observatory, and my friend Jim Scotty here is, was part of the, uh, uh, the Skywatch survey, to, and he discovered several hundred asteroids. But we just take pictures of the night sky, and we look for things like this. You see this streak going by there. Uh, that's, that's an asteroid going by. And, and so with computer analysis of these pictures that these telescopes are taking all the time, we're able to catalog these asteroids and figure out their orbits. And we will have the Near-Earth Surveyor um, satellite, which is scheduled to launch in 2028. And the goal of this is to try to find uh, all of those major asteroids that are uh, inward from the sun from us. Asteroids are very, very dark. And I'll show you a picture about a, a, how dark those are. They're darker than charcoal. And as we're looking towards the sun, those are the ones that it's hardest for us to see because the sunlight is blocking, um, is making it harder for us to see those. So the nearest surveyor is going to use infrared heat signatures to help us find uh, those, those asteroids. So how do we learn a little bit more about those asteroids? And I wanted to talk about the OSIRIS-REx mission. And this was uh, 
one that was a, a, it's a sample return mission that the United States launched to an asteroid to go and characterize that asteroid. This is one of the four, one of the four potentially hazardous kilometer size asteroids is, is the asteroid that it went to. And when NASA picked out the, the appropriate asteroid, they didn't have a name for it other than a number. And they did a, uh, a nationwide uh, competition for school children to name this asteroid. And this uh, young kid named um, Mike Puzio, who lives in Greensboro, North Carolina, came up with the name Bennu. Uh, Bennu being an Egyptian god that's related to Osiris. You can see Bennu there uh, with his one leg extended, looking a lot like the Osiris-Rex spacecraft. What's fun about, what's fun about Mike Puzio is he's, our, he's my neighbor in Greensboro. So uh, when it came time to actually launch this mission, here's Mike now, uh, third from the, the right of the bottom, standing next to Bill and I, the science guy, and my wife Jane and I are over here on the right. Mike and, and his parents invited us to come down to Kennedy Space Center and watch the launch which was uh, just a blast. We had a nice VIP seating to watch the launch of the OSIRIS-REx mission. And just a, a couple uh, home, uh, home snapshots here as, as OSIRIS-REx took off in the sunset. It was a, just a beautiful launch. Uh, if, you, if you've ever watched one at sunset from the Cape here, this is the shadow that the clouds cast is really kind of cool too in, the, in the, the, the light of the setting sun. Anyway, so that's my first of my tourist pictures. And then Mike and his dad and I uh, and Jane, my wife, went to the University of Arizona, which is the, uh, where the OSIRIS-REx mission is managed. We went back there two years later. Mike has now grown up from the third grade kid. He's now a freshman in college, actually just finished his freshman year of college. But we went to the OSIRIS-REx mission, mission headquarters about 42 days before OSIRIS-REx was due to rendezvous with Bennu. And we got a chance to talk to, this is the imaging team. These are the people who are going to be in charge of the cameras that were going to take pictures of Bennu. At this point, th th we had never seen Bennu up close. We'd only seen it as a, uh, as a speck in photographs or, or taken uh, radar images of it. But when I talk about how dark asteroids are, these are, these are shapes uh, of actual asteroids out there. And, you can see, and the darkness of these, this, these are the actual colors and brightness of those asteroids. So they are very, very dark objects. They just uh, you know, appear bright because the sunlight is so bright in outer space. But uh, again, we're looking at things that are from the very earliest, uh, a lot of these things are, are older than the Earth is. And uh, while the imaging team was waiting for uh, being able to take pictures, they were having a contest where they were going through and rating the different flavors of Oreos. So that's what this whiteboard is here, at, uh, give, assigning uh, uh, evaluations of Oreos. And anyway, they, uh, they got to be extremely busy 40 days later as OSIRIS-REx got to Bennu. And so this is, um, OSIRIS-REx spent three years at Bennu orbiting around this asteroid. It was a lot different than NASA imagined. We knew that there was this large rock on the bottom here, this big boulder that's about 50 meters across. But it was a lot more boulders. They thought there might be smooth areas that they could try to touch down. The idea with, with OSIRIS-REx, you, know, you saw that thing that was sticking down from the bottom of it that was called a touch-and-go sampler. And the idea was that we, they were going to lower it down very gradually, just barely touch the surface, and then fire off some jets of nitrogen, which would kick up material and then get collected by the sample collector. And they suddenly realized now that the, the surface was a lot more dangerous to try this kind of soft touchdown than they expected. But they eventually found a good spot, and uh, finally in September, or excuse me, October of 2020, uh, this, is, this is based on real data of what happened with OSIRIS-REx. They brought it in very slowly. This is sped up here. But as OSIRIS-REx got in close to the surface of Bennu, it was moving at a couple centimeters per second, about the, s about the speed of a bug crawling. So very, very slowly coming down to the surface. The idea is just to touch the surface, fire the jets, and back off. And as soon as it touched the surface, it just kept going. Uh, they fired these jets. You can see the material splattering out. This is, this is a recreation based on data they got back. It fired its, its retro rockets to try to take back off again. If, there, if it hadn't fired its rockets, it would have sunk completely into Bennu. Uh, the surface was that loosely packed. And so uh, just this very gradual touch and then firing of the jets to make it take back off again excavated um, uh, uh, about six tons of material and uh, cr created a crater 30 feet in diameter. Uh, so uh, we, when they talk about asteroids being rubble piles, that's what they really are. It's, it's very loose material that's very gently held together by the, by the very dim force of gravity 
that you have in one of these things, only a kilometer across, so the gravity is, is a less than a thousandth of what you have on the Earth. And so you have this rubble pile, which of, uh, you see there's not even any loose dust on it. The dust has all been kicked off by electrostatic charges. So all that's left are these rocks that are just held together basically in the same uh, type of density as a bowl of popcorn or uh, the, a fluid like uh, being in a, in a ball pit. So it, this makes it, things a little bit simpler. It's, it's not something that you can go and, and you know, chip away at or try to break up because it, it, it's a bunch of loose material that's all held together like this. But OSIRIS-REx did collect its sample and it's coming back to Earth and it's supposed to uh, be back here in September of this year and drop off its sample. And after, after it drops off its sample in a, in a capsule that will come back to Earth, the uh, spacecraft is going to be redirected towards another one of those potentially hazardous large asteroids, the asteroid Apophis. And OSIRIS-REx will become the uh, uh, OSIRIS Apex mission. Apophis is another one of those near-Earth asteroids, and we think there's even a greater chance of this causing a problem for us. Uh, there are a lot of scenarios when, uh, when Apophis was first discovered, it was a, there was a prediction of a 3% chance of it impacting the Earth within the next 100 years. That's been whittled down somewhat, but as we'll see here, there is a chance that a Apophis could impact Earth at some time in the next uh, 200 years or so. So on, on if, if you like uh, uh, thing on, on April the 13th, uh, Friday the 13th, Apophis is going to come by 20,000 miles away, so it's going to fly inside the orbit of um, the, uh, the geosynchronous satellites. It will just barely miss the Earth by about, tw again, 20,000 miles. That's, that's, a big di that's a safe distance. We know it's not going to impact Earth in 2029. But what happens to it as it goes around Earth, now you can see its path is bending, and so gravity is going to start playing an interesting effect here. So we've got gravity, which you know, Einstein would say is you know, creating d uh, dense in space time here. Uh, as Osiris, excuse me, as, as Apophis comes close to Earth, it, it'll be affected by gravity. But we also have this other effect called the Yarkovsky effect. And this is caused by heating on one side of the asteroid. As the asteroid rotates and then radiates that heat off, it actually impacts a slight change to the velocity of that asteroid. So instead of the asteroid traveling just as you would predict by gravity, this radiation actually causes its path to become more unpredictable. And so as Apophis starts coming by Earth again in 20, uh, 2135, we're not exactly sure where it's going to be because of the Yarkovsky effect. And so we know it's going to miss Earth, but where is it going to miss Earth? And we have what we call gravitational keyholes. There are certain places in the orbit if Apophis goes through that gravitational keyhole, it will bend its path such that it will impact the Earth the next time it comes around, or uh, the next time it comes close to us. So the, if it goes through the right keyhole, there is a possibility of an impact in 2182. I don't plan to be around here for that, but, uh, but so again, this, uh, and it's a low probability, but again, it's one of those things, because of the Yarkovsky effect, we don't know exactly where Apophis is going to be. So that's why planetary defense starts becoming important to us, and what can we do to protect ourselves from something like this happening? So how big is, is the threat we, from, we talked about Apophis and Bennu. Um, you know, what, what, when you start reading the tabloids now, you, you find it's, it's amazing we're still alive here. Large asteroids stronger than a nuke heading towards Earth in late January. Uh, potentially hazard asteroid headed towards Earth. The comet heading towards Earth bigger than Rhode Island. Um, Asteroid bigger than the Empire State Building coming. Uh, asteroid the size of a blue whale coming here. Asteroid the size of a giraffe. Asteroid half the size of a giraffe. Okay, uh, so how big is an asteroid? What does a half a giraffe asteroid look like? Does it look like this or this or this or that? Okay, and, and the real shame here, of course, is we have something that's half the size of a giraffe. We have the Okapi, and nobody said it was an okapi size asteroid. So the, the tabloids, when, they say heading, when we say heading towards Earth, we mean heading in the general direction of Earth. And just remember that space is incredibly large. And so the chances of these kind of, of impacts happening are very, very slim. You know, what, what scientists will tell you when you'll see this, they'll say, well, there might be a possibility of it hitting Earth. But what happens is we're, we're basing our, our prediction on the path of the asteroid or comet on only one or two observations. And so what happens is, um, we have to refine that error. And generally, we'll assign, to, to try to take the emotion out of this and the hype out of this, we have what we call the Torino scale, which um, 
we use to rate how, how likely an impact is and the type of kinetic energy it has. If, if it's a 10 on the Torino scale, we've got a certain collision and global devastation. If it's a 1, there's effectively a zero risk. Right now, there are no asteroids with a rating other than zero. There have been a couple when they were discovered that had a rating of one, and after a couple observations, those quickly moved to zero. So right now, don't worry. There is no asteroid that we know of that has this kind of risk of global devastation uh, that is in our, in our picture right now. But so this is how we take the emotion out of it when we talk about the risk of, of collision. And again, taking the risk out of it, this is the, when the, when the uh, astronomers initially discover an asteroid or a comet, we'll say there's an, uh, there's an error ellipse. We think it, it's going to come somewhere within this, this ellipse. The Earth just happens to be in there, so there is a possibility of it hitting Earth. But as we refine the orbit by studying it more and more, the size of that error ellipse shrinks, and then eventually, you know, we find out the error ellipse is completely, Earth is outside of that, and so the risk has become zero. And so everybody then says, well, why did you get us all worked up about it? And it's like, well, we didn't get you worked up about it. The newspapers got you worked up about it. But um, that's, it, it's all about refining the orbits and getting to learn it. So as we refine things, uh, it, it's important for us to try to, to, to pay attention to that, but at the same time, the risk begins to go down as we get to understand it more and more. But if we do understand the risk and we do find that there is a possibility of something potentially impacting us, what can we do about it? And so we have civil defense for things like Chelyabinsk. Basically, it's being prepared. If there is this type of event, how do you take care of the population to make sure you've, you've dealt with injuries and, and destruction? As you start getting larger and larger for the, uh, the asteroid, kinetic energy, which means hitting it uh, with, with just uh, transferring energy by colliding with it becomes a good way to disrupt it. The tractor away is, is not something that's been proven, but that's using a spacecraft as a gravitational tug on something, just at the, the gravity of a spacecraft being near an asteroid being enough to pull it off, of course. And then you get to the, uh, the um, uh, Armageddon type of thing, doing the nuclear type of thing for a certain dinosaur killer type of asteroid, but we don't know of anything like that right now. We have not tried... Uh, nuclear weapons in outer space, and I think that would definitely be a last resort. So what have we done to try this out? And uh, just in September this year, we did the DART mission. NASA did the DART mission, the dual asteroid redirection test. And we sent the DART spacecraft to this double asteroid, Didymos and Dimorphos. Uh, a lot of asteroids are double asteroids, surprisingly. A lot of them have moonlets, and um, the idea was to impact this small asteroid Dimorphos using the spacecraft itself traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour to crash into this asteroid and see if we could change its orbit just a little bit. And the idea is if you can change an orbit and you know a hundred years in advance where uh, it, it, that an asteroid might come and you can change its orbit a little bit, you can deflect it enough that it will miss the Earth a hundred years later. And so the idea was to try to change um, uh, Dimorphos' orbit by about 30 seconds if they could. And so uh, uh, the idea was to crash into it and change the energy of the, of the target. And so this is uh, the view from Mission Control oh for goodness. the DART mission in September of this last year. Yeah. Dimorphos is the big one on the, uh, like uh, excuse me, Didymos is the big one. And this is Dimorphos as we start getting closer into it. You'll see it looks a lot like Bennu. This was live view of the, uh, the spacecraft oh, wow. as it was coming in. People celebrating the destruction of their spacecraft, but th that was, you know, that was the that was what it was designed to do: crash into this. And just before just before it uh, redirected itself towards crashing into the in, into that smaller asteroid, it released a CubeSat that was uh, filming the event. So we got video of of the actual impact. And at uh, the same time, a lot of telescopes on Earth. We're monitoring these uh, these two asteroids to see what happened. It was it turned out to be a much bigger event than we anticipated. Uh, this is a, a picture from Earth, and you can see it created a long stream of debris that came out of there. Uh, this 
rather than changing the, the course of Dimorphos by 30 seconds, it actually impacted the orbital period of Dimorphos by 33 minutes. So it was a huge impact on the, uh, uh, on the uh, orbit of that asteroid. So all you need to do is, is create a two centimeter per second change in an asteroid for something that looks like it's going to come close to the Earth, and that will change its course enough over the course of 10 years so that it will miss Earth. So we now we know we've proven the concept. We need to probably try it with a bigger type of target, but we know we can do that. If we have enough advance warning, we can launch something to an asteroid and just hope that they don't fire back at us. Okay. Um, so this this so we've sent the asteroid uh, uh, the deflection test. The uh, European Space Agency is sending another spacecraft, which will go by these same two asteroids in 2026 and take a picture up close of what the actual impact was. So we think that's good news there. Uh, I don't know how, if, how many of you remember in the, uh, the movie Contact, no, not Deep Impact, where they, broke, they tried to break up a comet and it broke up into two pieces that then both came to Earth. And so that possibility exists. Comets are a much tougher thing than asteroids because they come from so far out in the, in the outer solar system. Again, the chances of them actually impacting Earth are very uh, minimal, but what could happen is if you have a large comet that comes in, uh, here we're talking about a comet that might be 100 kilometers in diameter, coming in from the outer solar system, it gets real close to the sun, which happens frequently, we call sun grazing comets, and then a lot of times these comets disintegrate as they pass close to the sun. And if you had a, a, a comet that was on the order of 100 kilometers in diameter and then it disintegrated as it went around the sun into a lot of smaller comets, now we have a lot bigger problem to worry about because we have all these small comets that might hit us instead of one big one that potentially would miss us. So what is, wh when has something like this happened? And this was actually happened in Jupiter in 1994. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was a regular comet. It got very close to Jupiter and Jupiter's gravity tore it apart and the next time it came around close to Jupiter, it was now a string of about 20 different comets. And over the course of several days, uh, they impacted Jupiter. And you can see the scars in Jupiter's atmosphere that were left by the comet punching a hole in its atmosphere as it went through there. Jupiter, the biggest planet, being affected by a small asteroid like this. And this was readily vi visible from Earth. I could see it with my backyard telescope. Uh, and these scars left uh, remained on Jupiter. You know, there, it's not a solid surface, but we saw the, Im the, the results of this kind of energy release for a long time after that. So what can you do to help out in this regard? What can you do personally? Uh, and this is an amazing age for us now. We've got some great technology. There are a number of telescope makers like uh, Unistellar uh, and Vionis that have automated telescopes, and you can become part of a program uh, they partner with NASA that you can use your telescope. Uh, NASA will tell you where to point your telescope to track a, an asteroid, and you can collect data in real time. Just set up your telescope in your backyard, let it do the tracking based on what NASA has, to has, has downloaded to your telescope to track. Send that information in, and it helps refine the orbits of asteroids. And so this is, this is an image of an asteroid I took uh, from North Carolina. This was an asteroid that passed about a million miles away from Earth. And uh, it, it's elongated here because it was moving so fast. Each, uh, each exposure is one minute long here. But this is the uh, course of 27 minutes of April of 2020 watching this asteroid pass by. So you can collect data like this with your telescope at home and, uh, and send that in to help refine the, the approach of orbits. And then you get a nice certificate like this for being part of a uh, uh, of, a, of a team like this, but you know it's it's serious. Uh, just like we were using uh, uh, crowd you know, kind of like crowdfunding your your telescope to help out in the in the search for planetary defense. So of all the th the threats that we're facing from asteroids and comets, number you know this is the potentially biggest one in terms of causing global devastation. But at the same time, I think it's the one we understand the best. And right now that we have, as long as we we have enough advance warning we are starting to, to feel confident that we can do something to help protect Earth in that regard. Uh, things that, this is a, we're gonna move on now to solar problems, and uh, this is not gonna cause necessarily global devastation or the extinction of civilization, but it is gonna cause big problems for the hum human race now. In uh, 1859, the astronomer uh, uh, Richard Carrington was observing the sun, looking at sunspots, and he saw one that, that brightened uh, dramatically. And what he didn't realize he was observing was a solar flare that was breaking out. 
And uh, this is what a solar flare looks like on the side of the sun here. This is a picture I took with my, my telescope last year. But um, this one is not pointed towards Earth. This solar flare he was observing was pointed towards Earth. And that the, what he didn't realize was happening was part of the, of the surface of the sun was being ejected off in the direction of Earth. And so 17 hours later, that energy hit Earth. And normally, we have, the Earth has this magnetosphere, magnetosphere that's created by our, our magnetic field that protects us from the solar wind. The high energy material is streaming from the sun, which is over on the left. Uh, in a strong event like the Carrington event of 1859, yeah, if, w one thing, I guess, if you want to be named, have something named after you as a scientist, you probably don't want it to be a big destructive event like the Carrington event or something. But what happened here in, in the Carrington event was this energy uh, hit us in so strong that, that electrical systems, uh, telegraph systems around the world failed over Europe and North America. They gave electrical, people who were sending telegraphs at the time, uh, got shocked from the induced current in the telegraph wires. Wires were catching fire and setting fires around them. The entire telegraph system, uh, when they realized there was something going on, they told everybody to unplug the batteries, and it still kept operating from the induced current that was uh, in those wires from the energy released by that solar storm. So if something like that were to happen nowadays, uh, we are looking at a, at a huge problem for our society right now. It, because this kind of thing will take down the electrical grid. It happened in Quebec in, in 1989. Uh, a, a solar storm caused the electrical grid to fail. It happened in Quebec because it's very close to the North Magnetic Pole, and that's where the energy came in. But right now, if something like this were to happen, if we were to have a Carrington-type event, uh, the Northeast of the United States would probably go down. We might lose electricity for, for months as a result of that. Um, the satellites would go down, probably be inoperative. Electronics would, would fry, the power grid would be down, communications would be disrupted, financial systems would be disrupted, astronauts in space would be I at risk. And you can see this is kind of like how complex our systems are, are interrelated with each other and interconnected. The electrical power goes down. Think about all the things that can go wrong here on Earth that we depend on electricity for. So what would happen? What would life look like for us? It wouldn't cause a mass extinction, but it would certainly cause some severe problems for us in terms of getting medication to people, getting water, uh, heating homes, and things like that. So we really need to be thinking about how we protect our critical systems from this. And we've been protecting ourselves somewhat from nuclear attack. And the, the, the uh, type of threat from a Carrington type event would be similar to having an electromagnetic pulse in the atmosphere from a nuclear bomb. But we are really a, a, at risk. And uh, we're talking tens of trillions of dollars to have to upgrade the, uh, the electrical system to make it more robust and to make it uh, resistant to this type of thing. And so far, no government on Earth has shown any inclination to put that kind of money into it. Uh, we actually think that uh, uh, you know, 163 years after the Carrington event, we're still not prepared for something like this to happen to us. So you know, in terms of a risk, I think this is a moderate risk to our society. It's not high in terms of risk to life. But we really need to be doing more than just watching the sun. We need to be thinking about how we protect ourselves from it. So other types of defense to be worried about here. Biological defense. When the Apollo astronauts came back from the moon, they wore biological isolation garments in case they had moon bugs. Uh, here are the astronauts inside a quarantine unit. Well, I, I like to say protecting themselves from President Nixon. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they stayed in isolation for a couple of weeks until we were sure they weren't carrying any, any germs back. But, um, you know, there is a possibility if we do send, uh, like, the Mars sample mission, the Mars sample return mission, you know, what, uh, how do we make sure that that material stays uh, uh, safe and doesn't have anything bad happen to it? This is the Genesis mission. Uh, this is an animation of showing what was supposed to happen as it was coming in. Genesis was sampling the solar wind, so it didn't get near any planets or anything biological. The idea is it was going to deploy its parachute over the Utah desert and it would be picked up by a helicopter. But what actually happened was that the uh, gravity sensor was installed upside down, and so the parachute didn't deploy. And so we watched on live TV as the Genesis capsule came in at several hundred miles an hour and hit the floor of the desert in Utah. And uh, you can see it created quite a splat. It broke open the capsule. It, it slightly contaminated the material that was inside. But if there had been anything inside of that we need to worry about, it, was re it would have been released into the atmosphere. And uh, 
I wonder about this guy we're going to see here that got up nice and close to it. It, it. When I saw this, of course, it immediately made me think of the Andromeda strain. I don't know how many of you remember that movie. I'm not going to go out and pick up any capsules I find lying around. I, I will do that. Um, so, we, so we've got to protect the Earth from, from outside biology if, if we do have these sample returns. You know, do we, do we drop them off at the space station and study them there, or do we have good quarantine possibilities for it? But we also, the, the Planetary Defense Office for NASA is also protecting other planets from us. We sterilize spacecraft before they go out, but nonetheless, we still leave contamination. This is the Bereshit lander from Israel, which we didn't know at the time, but was carrying several hundred tardigrades when it crashed into the moon. We think those were turned into tardigrade pulp but nonetheless, we contaminated the moon with biological material. This is a jettison bag on the Apollo 11 mission that contained um, uh, uh, fecal material and uh, other, other waste from the Apollo astronauts. So we left things like that on the moon, and we're going to do things like that. The moon, we don't worry about things growing, but if we go to Mars or any other area that's potentially habitable, we need to worry about contaminating those. Uh, so what other threats do we have out there? We have supernovas. So uh, a supernova uh, about 30 to 50 light years away from Earth would probably kill us through radiation or from uh, devastating effects on our atmosphere. Luckily, we don't know of any stars that are likely to go supernova within uh, 30 to 50 light years of Earth. In our galaxy, there's, like, there's on average a supernova about every 50 years. And there's two types of supernovas. There's one uh, that's caused by the explosion of a single star, and then the one we saw here, what, where you have a white dwarf that's orbiting a, a star and starts sucking the material off of the larger star. And eventually, the white dwarf becomes so massive that it explodes on its own. And this, this is called a type 1 supernova, 1A supernova. And there is one system that we're aware of that's about 159 light years from Earth that could potentially, at some point in its life, go into a type 1A supernova. We're not in any immediate risk of that. And we don't know if something like this happened 150 light years away from Earth, would that cause a problem for us? We just don't know. Uh, another thing that is, is relatively rare from a cosmic standpoint but could be potentially devastating for us is a gamma ray burst. And these are the, most, uh, the brightest and most energetic uh, events in the universe. And they result from the collapse of a supermassive star or from the collision of two neutron stars. And so uh, these things are very really short-lived. Gamma ray bursts only last between a th uh, 1 and 1,000 seconds, but they, again, are incredibly high energy. And we actually think that a gamma ray burst somewhere in the vicinity caused the late Ordovician extinction 450 million years ago. The, the neutrinos and the energy from that gamma ray burst uh, caused a large extinction of, of life on Earth. Again, we're not aware of any sources of where something like that might happen anywhere nearby for us in the foreseeable future. Uh, the threat of uh, the probability of threat is difficult for us to determine at this time. So I've taken you through uh, a, a kind of sobering look at uh, planetary defense. NASA actually has a planetary defense coordination office. The um, the the motto at the bottom: "Hic Cerveri Diem," here to save the day. Okay, so here I come to save the day. Uh, but you know th that's. They are, they are here to help us. NASA is taking this threat very, very seriously, and we are coordinating with a number of different government agencies and with international governments to help protect us. You know, if we do, if somebody pointed out the, the idea that said, what happens if you find out an asteroid is going to hit India, and India is at war with Pakistan, and India deflects the asteroid enough that it doesn't hit India, but it hits Pakistan instead. So we have to start worrying about uh, are people going to be, a nation's going to be out there taking the best interests of all of Earth to, uh, in, into account? And so that's one of the things we, we really need to be paying attention to is how do we protect our mother, our mother Earth, and continue to monitor these threats, but then work together as a team, as a species, as a family. You know, it, we hope that it's not going to take a, a team of roughnecks like Bruce Willis to go out and blow up an asteroid, but we really want to be prepared for the long game. And, uh, you know, there are, there are things that can happen tomorrow that we have no control over. But if we start preparing ourselves now, things like, uh, you know, you might I I consider some uh, uh, mentioning to, to some of your, your friends in office that uh, we might want to think about what we can do to strengthen the electrical grid just as, a, uh, as an op uh, opportunity for us to protect our way of life. So anyway, with that, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, my next talk will be about uh, the search for extraterrestrial life in our solar system. 
And so uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to that one. That's one of my favorite talks. And I hope you enjoyed this one today. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to meet me outside the Star Theater after this. Thank you.